Shimano Dura Ace has long been considered the gold standard of bike components. Bikes with Dura Ace on have won 18 of the last 25 Tours de France, if we include Mr. Armstrong. But how did we get to this point? Two thousand and twenty-three marks the fiftieth anniversary of Dura Ace, and the story of it is one that every cycling nerd and even some normal people need to know. So we partnered up with Shimano to tell it, and to help, I have got some stunning bikes to ride. Sean Yates' Seven Eleven team bike, a Lance Armstrong era Trek OCLV. One of Mark Cavendish's actual Tour de France stage winning specialised McLaren Venges, which might be a little bit small for me. And my own Pinarello, which could have won something, but hasn't. Wind back the clock to 1973, the year in which Pink Floyd released The Dark Side of the Moon, the Sydney Opera House was completed, the first ever mobile phone call was made, and Shimano released Dura Ace, their first group that aimed at high performance road racing, something that was completely new to them. They had already had a lot of success in the US, supplying derailers and three speed hub gears to the American behemoth. Schwinn. Schwinn! However, they did know that in order to crack Europe, they needed to have some success in road racing. And so the Dura Ace project began. Now, why the heck is it called Dura Ace, though, you wonder? Well, apparently, the name is a combination of duralumin, which was a specific type of aluminium alloy used in the first edition of Dura Ace, the word durability, and then also the word ace, just because who doesn't want their group set to be ace? I think it's fair to say that that first generation of Dura Ace very much looked like everything else available at the time, and for good reason, because us cyclists, even now, are quite sceptical of anything that looks and is new. But Shimano realised that in order to really get their foot in the door, they needed to work with a pro team. But they came up against a very narrow-minded, very dogmatic and very Eurocentric peloton. They did, however, manage to find one team that would work with them, the Flandria team from Belgium, who happily took the group set, but on condition that Shimano listened to their feedback and then implemented changes, which actually, when you think about it, it's kind of the blueprint for how Shimano has been working with teams ever since, basically. And they were both rewarded with a Tour de France stage win that year and second place in the men's world championships. So what were those earliest innovations then? Well, they started small, literally, with an 11 tooth sprocket in 1978, but it wasn't until 1984 and this 7400 group set that they hit the big leagues. And it was because of this. Yeah, they added clicks to shifters with Shimano Index System, or SIS. Prior to this, levers and derailers had been able to move freely, and they were held in place only with friction, meaning that you, the rider, had to manually adjust your gears on the fly. But then by adding clicks, Shimano simultaneously not only sped up shifting, but also dramatically reduced the amount of rider input required. This is such a treat. I love riding bikes with historical significance. Sean Yates is a flipping legend and this was his bike. Amazing. Now, back to the job at hand. I have, it's got to be said, spent quite a bit of time on friction shifters in recent years. And whilst they still have their diehard fans, the fact is, SIS, the addition of that click, it, ah, gear shifting, it's a part of cycling, right? but it's not a process that I particularly want to labor over. And so that click just meant you didn't have to give it a second thought. It sped things up and it made it 
a more satisfying process as well. So for me, it's a huge innovation. It's got to be said by the way, I'm not going to shift into the little ring because of a tribute to Sean. Now it's fitting that this 7400 is on a 711 team bike because like Shimano, 711 were also responsible for just broadening that very Eurocentric peloton. Alex Steeder was the first North American to wear the yellow jersey in 1986. And then in 1988, Andy Hampston was the first American to win a Grand Tour. And also the first rider to do so on Shimano Dura Ace. We've actually got a cracking documentary about that 88 Giro and it's utterly epic conditions over on GCM Plus. So you should go and check it out. The next big innovation was the creation of STIs in 1990, still part of that long running 7400 group set. And in it, Shimano moved the gear levers from the down tube up here to the brake levers. And if you thought index gears were a step forward, this enabling riders to change gear without taking their hands off the handlebars was basically revolutionary. I mean, if you think about it, for the first time you could change gear whilst riding out of the saddle. For the first time you could change gear whilst sprinting, even while braking. It was a total game changer for pros and mortals alike. Now, many of you will recognize this bike. It is a Lance Armstrong era Trek. Sadly, it's not actually one of Lance's. Rumor has it that most of their team bikes were sold to pay for drugs. And those that weren't, I suspect, were probably burnt at the stake when he confessed to doping in 2013. Now, fitted to this bike is Dura A7700, the successor to 7400. On the face of it, it perhaps lacks some of those big developmental steps that the predecessor had, but it still packs a punch. It's 500 grams lighter than 7,400. I mean, imagine that. We're so used to trading in a single gram saving here or there. If Shimano debuted a new group set that was 500 grams lighter, it's unthinkable by today's standards. Most of that weight saving comes from the crank set in the bottom bracket. So Shimano debuted with this group set, their Holotech technology. So for the first time the crank arms are themselves hollow and the bottom bracket axle as well. And it shed a truckload of weight. What are my impressions of this one then? Well, it's funny because this this is my era. This is when I joined the road cycling party. And so I was expecting it to be like a blast from the past. But it's really not. Despite having spent countless hours on a group set exactly like this one, on a bike exactly like this one, it's not bringing back any memories, which is so weird. But I, mean, I guess it's, it's like 20 something years ago. But anyway, let's not go there. Two things have jumped out at me jumping off Yates's bike and onto this one. Firstly, and that despite this being one generation later, and despite the addition of STI levers, Shimano clearly kept the ergonomics the same between brake levers with no gear shifting in and these new STIs. I guess to stop people feeling like it was too big a jump in terms of innovation, but they do feel so similar, even down to a little pointy bit on the back. Not a good thing in hindsight, given where we've got to with ergonomics now, but still very interesting. And the second point I was saying about how this innovation allowed you to shift whilst riding out the saddle and shift while sprinting. But what's really noticeable is that whilst you can do that, the shifting is not as crisp and as smooth as in the present day. So even though I can do 
shift right now, there are times when you do have to let off the gas a little bit to help ease the shift. It's just kind of what you had to do, but then kind of forgotten about that aspect in subsequent generations. I mean, it's pretty smooth if we're honest, but not quite at Dura DI2 levels. Have a look at this. A Mark Cavendish team bike from 2011. We have skipped a generation of Durace, as we said, 7800 came before this one. It debuted a strikingly new look crank and changed lever ergonomics. But the next real step forward, the next big one is right here. Durace DI2 digital integrated intelligence on this the 7900 version now shimano weren't the first groups at manufacturer to go electronic but it's fair to say they were the first to do it in a way that was both reliable and improved performance pro cyclists didn't all make the jump immediately though mark cavendish's team bike from 2010 has mechanical durace on but by 2011 he had made the switch I mean, crucially DI2 was lighter than the mechanical version as well as being faster. And Cadell Evans, you remember, won the Tour de France that year and he became the first rider to win it using an electronic group set. And Mark Cavendish took home the green jersey as well as a gazillion stages on this very bike. Now that first generation of Durace DI2, you can see has that external battery. It hadn't yet migrated to its hidden place in the seat post. And you'll also notice as well that Cam's got an SRM power meter on there. Shimano hadn't yet got a power meter for Durace. It was still in development, but it wasn't until the next generation that we saw it. The inner cycling fan in me is ridiculously excited to be riding this bike. I mean, talk about history. It's incredible. And in terms of how it feels, it's like we've stepped in to the modern era with this bike. I don't know what it is. Perhaps it's a combination of deep section carbon wheels, but certainly the levers now just feel right and comfortable. And then the DI2 shifting, I mean, it's so good. Although it's improved over the last two generations, I mean, no wonder Shimano didn't have much of an effort convincing pros to use it. It's just outrageous. Also, as a complete aside, this is the first time I've ever used a pro vibe stem, beloved of sprinters the world over. I've never needed one. Firstly, because my sprint is crap. And secondly, because my arms are far too weedy to warrant it. But I have never, ever used a cockpit as stiff as this. Turns any pothole into a sledgehammer blow. But my goodness me, if I could win a stage of the Tour de France, I'd have used one of these for sure. Now here's an interesting thing about Dura 7900. It was the first time the group set didn't have completely polished silver components on there. There was this dark anodized finish. These cranks, incidentally, are from the previous version. And it's a really important moment because for me, nearly 40 years after the start of Dura Race, it was when Shimano really got into their stride with leading the way in terms of aesthetics as well. And when you think about it, what the Dura Race group set, and particularly the crank set, looks like pretty much sets the tone for race bikes over a four year period. It's like one of the most hotly anticipated parts, and there must be so much pressure on the designers to get it right. This was a good one, 100%. In 2016, the world was aghast that Dura Ace had gone black. Apparently, the black graduated design coming from Japanese ink wash painting expresses the flow of power. 
This represents a commitment to expression distinctly Japanese. Took that straight from their website. Now, interestingly though, that was not the first time that Dura-Ace had been black. Oh no, there were several iterations in the earliest years where you could buy a two-tone black and silver Dura-Ace group set. Oh yeah, you could be forgiven for not knowing that, but it is true. We do sometimes hear murmurs from the corners of the internet that tech innovations have become less significant somehow on the more recent generations of Duras. But even with a tiny bit of hindsight, it's quite clear that that is not the case. In 2016, we had Dura Ace hydraulic disc brakes for the first time, complete with utterly tiny lever bodies, which somehow they had managed to engineer everything into. There was a power meter as well for the first time. Synchro shift meant that your DI2 could be changed to be semi automatic. Gear ratios continued to evolve, responding again to the needs of pro riders, an 11 to 30 option was added. Even the mechanical version improved with a new front derailleur design. In 2017, that group set, 44 years after the first, completed the Grand Slam at the Tour de France. All stages and jerseys were won using Jura Ace, with Marcel Kittel even taking five-stage wins on a bike with disc brakes. And then here we are with this latest one, 9200. We have got 12 speeds, so double the amount of gears that we started out with 50 years ago. The shifting is wireless, so no cables and not even really any wires to speak of either. We have got the fastest shifting ever and the smoothest shifting ever because Shimano have refined all of the complex architecture of ramps and pins and chamfers on the cassette and the chain and the chain rings. We've got 11 to 34 cassette options, despite pro cyclists going faster than ever and almost incredibly despite 50 years of improvements there is no mechanical shifting option at all Shimano simply said mechanical shifting doesn't meet the criteria of their Dura Ace level anymore the world has moved on Of course, it hasn't always been plain sailing over the last 50 years, and there is one generation of Dura Ace that is now incredibly rare, Dura Ace AX. So it was released in 1980, and it is the most futuristic Dura Ace ever. It was designed to be as aerodynamic as possible, but it suffered for being released 30 years too soon. So legend has it, Shimano built a wind tunnel in order to be able to test it, bike manufacturers had to change decades old manufacturing techniques in order to be able to fit it. And even the marketing materials look like something out of a sci-fi film, albeit one that is rather familiar to us today. And it was, by all accounts, a commercial disaster. But I have heard it said that it laid the foundations for Shimano's later success, because all of their rivals suddenly had a fear of being left behind. And so they quickly re-engineered their products, which took its toll financially. Whilst I've tried really hard to get it today and failed, I have seen it before. It is the most prized bike in the founder of Canyon, Roman Arnold's collection, where it serves as a symbol to him of innovation and the quest for making the best products possible, irrespective of the outcome. Having ridden these four vintages of Dura Ace today that span over 30 years, it is incredible to experience how both simultaneously so much has changed, but also in a way so little. I mean, the process of riding each bike is of course the same. The speed with which you're propelled down the road is ultimately about how much power you can get from your legs. And the efficiency that you get from a chain drive system kind of feels the same. I mean, it's, it's a brilliantly efficient system. But yet also at the same time, you can really feel just how much more refined your interaction with the bike has become. I mean, the amount of feedback that you get from the brakes and 
how little input you need to put into shifting now that means that the process is basically subconscious and then also there's the ergonomics of your levers and how they've improved and the broader gear ratio that means that you can spend more time in an optimal cadence on a wider variety of roads it's quite mind-blowing really and whilst if at any point over the last 50 years someone had put a stop to tech innovation i think we'd all be happy with wherever we ended up but as a cycling nerd, I've got to say, today has made me even more excited about what's potentially going to come in the future. I've got no idea. If you do, get involved in the comment section down below. I'll be very much looking forward to reading those. Before leaving this video, though, please give it a big thumbs up. We've got to say thank you to Dan from Vintage Velos for lending us three of his amazing bikes. If you want to see more of them, you can, of course, head over to his YouTube channel and check them out. And also... As always, a big thank you to Shimano for helping us make this video. It has been an absolute pleasure. Do remember to check out the GCN Plus documentary on the Giro 88. In fact, why don't you head over there now?